Hi, welcome to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, your host uh, every month, uh, every day, whichever, however often you watch the show. And uh, as you know, if you watch the show, we have uh, an occasional series where we interview one person for the whole show, and this is one of those. But it's also a nice conjunction of a current event, uh, very, very important to our community. Because today we're going to be talking to Rabbi Denise Egger, who is the founding rabbi of Congregation Kolami, the co-chair of the Gay and Lesbian Rabbinic Network, and the chair of the Ad Hoc Committee on Gays and Lesbians in the Rabbinate of the Central Conference of American Rabbis. And of course, as we read the papers, we know that that is the conference that recently passed a resolution, thanks in part to Rabbi Denise, supporting the ability of rabbis to officiate at same-sex um, commitment ceremonies. And that was an amazing uh, front page item all around the world. We're delighted to have you here, Thank Denise. You. Thank you for doing this. Glad to be here with you. Well, you know, I, um, I've always been interested in what brings a person to uh, really to a, a religious or a spiritual calling uh, because you are at a, a very interesting uh, junction uh, for our community really between the person who is active in our community in the gay and lesbian community and a person of faith, a leader in the community of faith, uh, a community that sometimes we've been having a great deal of struggle with. So starting back, not too very far because you're very young, um, where, uh, where were you born and where did you grow up? Uh, I was born in uh, Pennsylvania, outside of Pittsburgh, uh, but really claim Memphis, Tennessee is the hometown that I grew up in. Uh, our family moved around a bit uh, when I was uh, young and uh, we landed with near other family in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, and it's a wonderful community. Uh, a small Jewish community, uh, but we had a very large reform synagogue. Uh, at that time, probably about 1,500 families, huh. um, one of four synagogues in town. And uh, interesting, in the South, people are connected and they're affiliated with the Jewish community. In America today, in large cities, most Jews don't belong in a formal way to the Jewish community. It's just the opposite of what you might think, though, or what right. we might think, right. because you picture the South and it sounds like the Bible Belt, and even though the Jewish community can certainly lay claim to the Bible, <laughs> it's not really what we mean when we say Bible Belt. Right. And you don't think about Jewish communities in the South, and if you do, you would think they would be quite beleaguered by right. the larger community. But the, it's a very old Jewish community. In fact, it's re actually older in some ways than some of the major Jewish communities around our, the country, because uh, Jews uh, in the South came here, really traced their roots to Germany, and came in the early 1800s. Uh -huh. uh, uh, and so it's a very old Jewish community, and uh, it's a, but it's also a very connected community, and Jews belong to the community, and so it was a, actually a wonderful Jewish place to grow up. Uh, we, we had a wonderful community life, a uh, wonderful social life, and because it was Memphis, Tennessee, uh, and it was the a place where Martin Luther King was assassinated. Um, there was special ties between our Jewish community in Memphis and, and that event. Uh -huh. um, our rabbi, uh, at the time Rabbi Wax, was involved and connected with Dr. King who had come to Memphis for the sanitation strike. Mm -hmm. And so um, those were inspiring times and uh, that connection actually does, I think, still fuel my work uh, in what we do today. Well, did you, uh, were your parents active in the, the Jewish community uh, more than just uh, in terms of worship? Uh, my family history, uh, really, the, my family had always been involved in Jewish life and active in Jewish organizations. Um, in Pennsylvania, they had been very active. My father had been president of that synagogue, my mother president of that uh, Hadassah and that sisterhood. When we, by the time we moved to Memphis, they were past their leadership days, but for me, uh, that was still a connection and, and my involvement. And I taught religious school from the time before my bat mitzvah. Huh. I was uh, teaching in our Sunday school and uh, in our synagogue and, and very involved and attended Jewish summer camp, believe it or not, in all places of Mississippi. Huh. Um, <laughs> and in a small town between Jackson and, and uh, Vicksburg uh, is the Reform Jewish Summer Camp in Utica, Mississippi. And it was a wonderful place filled with Jewish learning and 
for those of us who came from New Orleans, from Memphis, from small towns throughout Mississippi and Arkansas, um, it was a real place of Jewish utopia um, because for once we were not in the minority. We had a sense of majority and a um, place where we could really be Jewish all the time. Um, I, I know that even when we find a community where we feel, even for just a summer, that we can be part of a majority, uh, some of the experience that we have is being a minority, you know, within whatever our cultural right. heritage is, even if we're already a minority within that. And I wonder what your experience was about that. Well, that, that was a problem. Um, I've been known out to myself since I'm 12, mm -hmm. um, but spent most of my adolescence trying to hide it and run away from it. And so that was a pretty painful part for me. Um, as good as I felt about being Jewish and involved and uh, connected to other people, that was a very hidden part and a very painful part. And so the South was not a particularly good pace, place to be gay or lesbian. No. Um, and um, as a result, needless to say, I didn't stay. Well, but while you were still in the South, you clearly developed this notion, uh, even as a child, I guess, um, that you might want to go further than most people go in their faith. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not saying hierarchical or anything, but just to make the decision that you may want to study and become a rabbi. Um, you know, it's certainly a step beyond what most Jewish kids might be thinking. How did that, how did that come to you? Well, you know, Sheila, I know you know that I like music and that yeah. I studied singing and voice for many years. And I um, originally thought I'd be a cantor, which is the other Jewish clergy person, uh -huh. um, because I love music so much and studied voice. And, and um, in my first couple years of college, which I stayed home in Memphis to pursue, to continue to work with my voice teacher, um, really felt like music was going to be my avocation rather than my life's work. But the Jewish stuff still hung in me, and the social justice issues still burned. And um, I thought, well, what better way to do that than perhaps move to the other side of the pulpit? Uh, and well, it's, I understand that, but tell me you also mentioned about Dr. King, yeah. how, that, how the Civil Rights Movement affected your consciousness still in Memphis. Well, it's interesting, My, our cousins owned a store on Bill Street, um, um, and owned a wholesale business on Bill Street, and I used to have to take my mother to work every day. She worked in the, that family business as well. Um, and it's not so far from the Lorraine Motel where Dr. King was shot. And in those years, now it's all redeveloped and there's a civil rights museum there, but in those years it was a hovel. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember taking my mother to work and before I'd go off to school, uh, I'd drive down and sit in front of it and I, I just tried to imagine and contemplate why that would happen. I couldn't imagine and it was so much a part of what we were taught in, at home about the dignity and equality of all people, um, how something like that could happen. And so I have very clear images of kind of being fueled in my own spiritual search and also in search for justice um, about how to make the world a better place. That that's a very present and very vivid image in my mind of the uh, civil rights struggle that the Afri African American community went through and still goes through sometimes. You know, there's a, um, a deep intellectual aspect um, uh, to uh, not only uh, to uh, sort of the rabbinate, but to the, yes. the whole, I mean, all people of, of faith in the Jewish community. Um, it, it involves a great deal of study and analysis. And I um, have always admired and respected your ability to be um, enthusiastic about, engaged in, uh, sort of really loving the intellectual strain in it too. Dr. King was like that as well. He read voraciously and was always uh, bringing things in. Um, so did you feel well served by your education in Memphis or is, is that one of the reasons that you left? Um, I, I, I really, I left because I really was struggling with my sexuality and knew that it wasn't a place that I could explore that safely or um, really could c try and come to terms with it. And I also knew that if I wanted to gain a higher level of Jewish study, that it would have to take me from my home base and my home Jewish community. 
Um, and so that's when I came to California and uh, did Jewish studies in college at USC, at Southern University of Southern California. And um, because of the unique relationship between Hebrew Union College, which is the Reform Jewish Movement Seminary and USC out here, I took a lot, most of my coursework really at the seminary as an undergrad. Huh. Um, and so that really began to feed in a real concrete way both my um, desire for a more in-depth Jewish knowledge as well as uh, really kind of framing my decision to want to become a rabbi. Jewish studies, uh, what year was this? I don't know that SC, did SC know they had a Jewish studies major? <laughs> <laughs> they did, but uh, I was the first, actually. Uh -huh. uh, uh, they always had a program on the books, but, you know, in Los Angeles, and you're a native, you know, you went to UCLA <laughs> for Jewish studies, not USC. Uh -huh. um, but uh, they did have this program on the books, and what did I know? I'm just a kid from Memphis. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so uh, I was able to be a religion major, specialized in Jewish studies through the cooperative efforts of the university and Hebrew Union College, and they have many programs on the books together still today, from PhDs to MBAs, and the undergraduate program um, is quite strong. Hebrew Union College today su supplies most of the uh, undergraduate Jewish studies program for USC. Huh. Um, and so that's really grown <laughs> since that time. So here you are in Los Angeles. Here I am You're in Los certainly Angeles. out about being a Jew. Uh, not a bad thing to be in L.A. I mean, no. maybe not as much of a minority in the community, as you said, in a way more fragmented and yes. maybe not as easy to connect with, but you're also a lesbian. Yeah. And that is a strand that it doesn't sound to me like had quite come together it, yet. It really didn't, and actually I was um, pretty afraid of having it come together, although dealing with it more once here in Los Angeles with the freedoms of being away from home and being a new community, but still struggling about, well, how can I be a rabbi and be gay? In those years, you weren't out. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so um, those, were, those were questions that I had for myself. And um, remember having dialogue with myself, well, I'll be a rabbi, I'll choose the rabbinate, okay, I won't get married, I won't be partnered, that's just a choice that I'll li make. Um, you know, I'm lucky it didn't ha turn out that way. Right, but you thought at the time, I, <laughs> I mean... I thought at the time I'd have to make some conscious choices about those decisions. And you would be a, a, a single, apparently straight rabbi apparently. And, uh, and not able really even to pursue. I mean, it right. must have been scary, really, to think that you would have either a hidden part of yourself or a, or a celibate right. life. Very, it was very scary, um, and I was very conflicted about it. And I, I, really, um, I really struggled with it a lot and really but I really knew that um, being a rabbi is something that I really was called to do and really wanted to do and felt like I could make a difference um, in the world. And how did it begin to come together? Well I, I did get accepted to rabbinic school and came went to Israel for the year and uh, as we all do at our Israel campus and uh, really when I came back to Los Angeles to finish my studies at Hebrew Union College, I, I really realized um, that there might be an opportunity to both be Jewish and gay and had that chance to meet other uh, Jewish, gay, and lesbian folks and begin to connect through kind of the underground, if you will, with other gay and lesbian rabbinic students mm -hmm. uh, and rabbis um, and really begin to see that well, maybe there, this wasn't such an either-or position. And um, I think that was a real eye-opener. But, but many people still were not out publicly in that time. Um, there were gay synagogues. It was still, still fairly new um, within the first 10 years. Um, but nevertheless, there was already beginning a network of gay and lesbian folks who were rabbis, maybe closeted, but at least there was a community of acknowledgement together. And so already there seems to be a place to stand. So what was the first evidence of it here in Los Angeles? Well, Beit Chaim Chadashim is the first gay and lesbian synagogue here in the world. And um, that was founded in 1972. Mm. And uh, so by the time I came to Los Angeles, that was already going strong and had the opportunity to visit there as a, uh, 
young rabbinic student on many occasions and uh, was a member at one time. And um, so I think that was a place of safety. And, and that synagogue spawned other synagogues around the country, uh, Miami, San Francisco. Um, and uh, that San Francisco had a rabbi, a gay rabbi serving it, a Rabbi Alan Bennett. Um, and so that, those are the things that gave hope at that time. Now, was there any real inherent conflict, both either sort of religiously, I mean, one of the interesting things about the passage of time is that we tend to open our minds to inclusion more and more. It's happened in this country from, uh, you know, the whole last half of the 20th century. But until that happens, there's sort of an adamance about what the rules are, what the truth is, what God really meant, etc. And it, it changes over time as we expand our own horizons. Was there, what was the conflict like inside um, the faith itself about mm -hmm. these issues at that time? Mm -hmm. Well, interestingly enough, Reform Judaism, because it placed so much emphasis on social justice as an avenue for spirituality. Uh, remember, the Reform Movement was very involved in the early African American Civil Rights Movement. In fact, the first president and the founder of the NAACP right. was a reformed Jew, Kivi Kaplan. Right. And so there's always been this historic connection between the call of the prophets to be just and to bring, bring truth where there isn't any and for the dignity of all people, that the reform movement has also been there all along the way in our gay and lesbian struggle for civil rights. And so in the late 60s and early 70s, the reform movement passed resolutions to already call for the decriminalization of consensual sexual acts between adults. And in the early 70s, welcomed gay and lesbian congregations into the mainstream fold of Jewish life. But not a lesbian rabbi. But not yet officially ordaining gay or lesbian people. Mm -hmm. But there was a sense that gays and lesbians had a place in the community, both the Jewish community and then our larger society. And I think that compassionate response really helped to not just change the Jewish community, but really helped to change uh, many different parts of our larger society as well. Did you have any personal doubts about your own sexuality being a positive aspect of your faith? I mean, if you're told by everyone else or so many other people. I mean, it was a, it's a struggle. Um, did you have your own doubts about it that you resolved? Um, at that time, yeah, I, I struggled greatly about it. I mean, how can you read Leviticus <laughs> and it says a man shouldn't lie with a man as, it lies, as you lie with a woman and, and not feel some of those feelings? Um, but I've never been a literalist um, and Reform Judaism certainly has, doesn't represent uh, a tradition that is a literal fundamentalist tradition. It's always been a progressive tradition that understands that we come to understand new truths about science, about nature, as we discover more that God gave us the talent and creativity to learn more and thirst for knowledge and quest for new things, that that's also part of God's revelation to us. And so those are the ways that I kind of began to struggle and ease that struggle within myself about some of those issues. And how did uh, Congregation Cola Me come about? Well, about eight years ago, we're about celebrating our eighth anniversary this year, uh -huh. uh, a group of us uh, decided uh, to uh, start a new congregation here in West Hollywood. We had a vision of how we thought synagogue life ought to be. And that was uh, not just a gay ghetto, if you will, but a community that was engaging of the whole spectrum, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered, and oh, God forbid, straight people as well. <laughs> <laughs> and so we came to a city like West Hollywood, which had no liberal synagogue of its own, and felt like we could make a difference here and make a kind of synagogue that we all wanted to see, but maybe wasn't always out there. A place that was really, truly welcoming and celebratory of gay and lesbian life, but also included our straight family and friends and who couldn't imagine their lives without us as much as we couldn't imagine our lives without them. And um, 
most importantly, that we were committed to social justice issues. You can see it's a passion and a theme of mine, sure. uh, mine as well, but uh, we really um, focus a lot of our energy as a community on social justice issues, on civil rights issues, particularly gay and lesbian issues, uh, but not only gay and lesbian issues. And um, uh, we have a very activist congregation, people in their own right are uh, great civil rights uh, activists in our congregation um, and have done much for our gay and lesbian movement as well as our Jewish community um, involvements. And so uh, it's a really dynamic, dynamic synagogue in that sense. Well, it's interesting to me how each group or person really can open the door for the next. I mean, um, tell the story of the founding of uh, BCC. Well, it's a, yeah, it's an interesting story because uh, uh, Ben Chaim Kharashim really got started because uh, there were Jews that were attending Troy Perry's church, a metropolitan community church in the late 60s. Um, and uh, my understanding is the story was told to me, you know, the Jews couldn't be actually members of the church because they wouldn't profess faith in Jesus, but they were associate members. And where else <laughs> did you go but to Troy's church if you didn't only want to hang out in the bars in those years? Uh -huh. um, and the story that was told to me was that one night there was a rap group and um, it got canceled, but they forgot to call the Jews. Who, <laughs> and everybody showed up at this meeting and they looked around the room and said, oh, we're all Jewish. Well, maybe we should start a synagogue. Uh -huh. They went to Troy and probably Troy's the first uh, pastor that ever founded a synagogue, <laughs> but um, helped the group get started. And, and interestingly enough, they turned to the UAHC, the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, which is the synagogue arm of the reform movement, and they received help there. And, huh. and um, so one group does help spawn another group and helps to build institutions, which um, which I think is a really important thing. I'm an institutional kind of person and believe that institutions are there to help people and are about the people. And uh, well, it was I think that's a good thing. When you said, you know, the attention of Cole and me to the inclusion of the families uh, and friends, straight friends, mm -hmm. um, and transgendered people. Mm -hmm. And uh, we sort of let this phrase roll off the tongue yes. now that we're, you know, uh, we include bisexual right. people and transgender, but it, it isn't that easy to, yes. to be, pay attention, to really pay attention to the differences without, you know, because transgendered people aren't necessarily gay That's people. Right. Might be, That's might right. not be, That's right. and the the issues are different. But the lack of acceptance, even in our own community, it's where big. it was kind of like, I'm here, you know, now gay and lesbians okay. The rest of you guys have to wait. You know, turn. please don't bother me because you're still not acceptable. I think it's a very, very important thing in communities of faith as well. And a, you I know, probably, I think maybe even more so there because community faiths, you know, it's no, it's no secret that uh, communities of faith have not been such so good on a whole host of issues. Um, uh, the patriarchy uh, has held women back, certainly gays and lesbians, um, and we can't, I don't think it's good for us to have communities of faith um, that would then go around and do that to other folks. We've walked those shoes, we ought to know better. Right. Um, and so, you know, that doesn't mean it's easy. Because it's not easy because the Jews should know. That's right. You know, I mean, we That's would have right. said from the beginning that everyone ought to know. That's right. Uh, but you know, you have to welcome the our, our, the Jewish prerogative is to welcome the stranger in our midst, and also we take that ethical responsibility to say that there's one law for the stranger and the citizen, for the resident alien and the citizen. And, and I think that's true. We have to figure out a way to work through our differences. Mm -hmm. um, men and women in our community have been doing it and continue to do it. Uh, uh, and we have to do that with straight folk and we have to do that with bisexual folk and transgender folk. And, uh, but I think that's I think that's the challenge to come and to be honest about our differences but also kind of just be accepting of them. We don't have to convince each other all the time of that we're right and you're wrong. Sometimes we need to live, live in the tension of those differences. Well, I was thinking when you were saying you had thought early on that perhaps you would have to live a single closeted life in order to be a rabbi, and yet the life of the family is so important in the congregation. And, and people look to the rabbi to if not set an example, at least to do their very best, mm -hmm. you know, about family. And so that would have been even a greater loss, but mm -hmm. you have a family. I do, I'm very lucky. Tell uh, us about your family. My uh, partner of uh, 10 years now, Karen Seitman, who is an activist in her own right and in our community, past chair of the Gay and Lesbian Center Board of Directors here in Los Angeles. Um, we have a six-year-old son 
who's just a wonder and a joy. And I think that this whole family issue is, um, is also something that our community's learning about and learning how to deal with. And is also another difference, because there is a difference for those of us that have families with children as opposed to f just families of adults. <laughs> right. And um, there's not always a lot of patience in our gay and lesbian community for families with children. Although getting Tolerance. to be more, I know Although that some, to be more, yes. I mean, some, I know some of your congregants, yes. of course, <laughs> and I know those that have grown children and yes. grandchildren. Uh, I know a few who have just adopted. Yes. Um, it's, uh, it's a growing congregation, uh, very, very much like everywhere else. Everywhere else. And, but, I think, but I think the ability for our community to, to do that, and certainly gays and lesbians have been having children for a long time, it's not anything new, but to do it perhaps in the constellations in which we're doing that with intent from the beginning um, is, uh, and, and in such numbers, in such great numbers, both women and men, uh, is, uh, I think, also a new trend and I think is something that will enriches our community. Um, and I think that really goes also to the heart of some of this, of the whole debate about marriage in our community. Because, see, what I think marriage is is about making family and making a statement, not just of your love for somebody. You can love somebody without getting married to them. People have been doing that for centuries. Um, and so one of the greatest, greatest love stories in the world about those who like, can't get it together to get married, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's about making family and making family commitments, whether there's children or there's not children. And yet, you've made a family commitment. Absolutely. But you can't get married. And for many years, of course, your union wouldn't have been sanctioned um, because it wasn't really either encouraged, not only by the Jewish faith, but all organized religion, uh, or there were some mavericks who, you know, like uh, many of the pastors that lined up in Sacramento and, you know, performed a ceremony for our couples. Right. Um, it was... Uh, and then put on trial know, for and it. And then put on trial for it. So they themselves, like anyone who identifies with a beleaguered minority, right. suddenly finds that they're now going to share the disopprobrium that, you know, that we have as, as gay people. But the notion of sanction, I mean this in the positive sense, where a religious body um, or person or figure makes a marriage by officiating mm -hmm. at it, and on the secular side where the state recognizes yes. a marriage or parentage. I mean, yeah. it's interesting. Parentage is the woman who gives birth to the baby, that's the mother. But the state says who the father is legally. Right. Could be the man who's married to the mother, could be a natural father that claims the child, could be somebody that signed the birth certificate. We create laws to say who parents are. Could be adoptive parents. Right. And it's a great power. Parents. And it's a great power. Right. And it's a power of approval, not only that you form the families, because as you have, you can yes. form a family without any of that. Absolutely. And it's a real family. But the power of approval is the one the question of that has been the question that you've been engaged in now yes. most recently, um, and it was on the national level. What, what brought you from, now you may have been doing this all along, but from the local work uh, in your congregation to want to participate on the national level, mm -hmm. not only in this issue, but in all issues? Mm -hmm. Well, I've been involved in this for a very long time within our movement on gay and lesbian issues. I mean, I'm one of the first lesbians rabbis out publicly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I mean, there have been other lesbian rabbis who've gone before me, but um, really the, one of the very first out uh, publicly. And so uh, I've been involved kind of at a national level uh, as a resource, as someone involved in these issues in the Reform Jewish movement for many, 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 many years now. Um, but in this particular uh, wonderful success that we just achieved in our conference in Greensboro, North Carolina, of all places. <laughs> uh, again, tied to the civil rights huh. movement because Greensboro was where the lunch counter sit-ins began. That's right. And in fact, the beginning part of our conference was all dedicated to celebrating that. Julian Bond of the NAACP came to speak to the rabbis because of our historic ties of the reform movement to the African American civil rights movement and to have then this resolution play itself out there in such an overwhelm with overwhelming support um, again kind of for me was really kind of the fulfillment again of this per my own personal connection 
between being inspired by Dr. King sitting in front of the Lorraine Motel um, all right. those years ago. But the reform, but so exciting about this resolution and, and the history behind it is that um, it, there, in our movement, we had some committees to kind of study different issues. Um, and uh, the Human Sexuality Commission was given the task of studying the issue of gay marriage. Because in 1996, the reform movement, the rabbis endorsed civil marriage for gays and lesbians. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we wanted, mm -hmm. uh, is mm -hmm. to endorse this notion of civil marriage. Because in our gay and lesbian understanding, we were very clear that we weren't going to talk about religious marriage. We were going to talk about civil marriage. Because that was the power of the state to decide mm -hmm. who gives, gets a license and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. So that resolution in 96 was very clear it was about civil marriage. But it did raise all the issues. Well, we're talking about marriage. We're rabbis. What does that mean in a religious or spiritual context? So the Human Sexuality Committee of the CCR was given the task to study it, and they did. For two years, they brought in experts on gay and lesbian issues. They brought in experts on marriage. They brought in all kinds of experts. And they were ready to issue a report in the spring of 98. Um, and in the spring of 98, that report was, and the, out of that report was going to come a resolution that, that said basically what we've said this March 2000, which was that same gender relationships are worthy of Jewish ritual sanctification. The, it ne the resolution never came before the plenum. Hmm. Uh, because concurrent with that, another committee came out with a report that basically marriage between t a gay, two gay men or two lesbians could not be classified as the sacrament of kiddushin, as we say in Hebrew. It's a specific word that has to do with holiness. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a lot of controversy and a lot of back and forth and a lot of real rancor about what to do and whether it was marriage, whether it was something other than marriage. So uh, the resolution didn't come before the plenum. But out of that, the committee that I chair, the Task Force on Gays and Lesbians and the Rabinet, was given the task of education programs. and so across the United States and Canada and each region uh, of rabbinic region of the country we had workshops and we brought in couples who had gotten married and we brought in their rabbis to talk about the process what did they do there what did the ceremonies look like what were the liturgies like um, and rabbis talked and studied and debated and argued is it a real a marriage is it something else is it a commitment ceremony what is it what is the nature of it how does it look like we brought in rabbis to talk about the education processes they had to do with their synagogue communities mm -hmm. um, and their boards of directors who, like most Americans, are split on gay and lesbian issues. Um, uh, and in 1999, the Women's Rabbinic Network, which is the Women's Caucus of the Central Conference of American Rabbis at our conference, um, we brought forward a resolution there to say, OK, it's enough study. Let's get to the vote. and. Uh, um, it still didn't come in 99. Uh, and so again, we introduced, the Women's Rabbinic Network introduced a resolution that basically repeated the language of the Committee on Human Sexuality's finding. That, first of all, we could support rabbis who officiate, because certainly look at the Methodists, they were being brought to trial. Right. It's clear that there was not, there's different denominations and even congregations that might not let their rabbis officiate at same gender ceremonies. So we, first of all, we want to sanction that each rabbi had the power to decide for him or herself, which is a tenet of Reform Judaism. We don't have that fiat. Right, right. Um, and we wanted to support the notion that same gender relationships between two Jews can be worthy of ritual sanctification. And so that's the resolution that we brought forward. And now that was studied for a whole nother year and debated within the movement. Um, and, it, and it was hotly debated. And just like you earlier talked about when groups get identified with disenfranchised groups and, and all of the trouble, Believe me, there were plenty of nasty things said about the women rabbis. Mm -hmm. Why are they forcing us to deal with this issue? They're just all a bunch of lesbians. Um, the two women who, Rabbi Shira Stern and Rabbi Susan Stone, who are our co-chairs of the Women of Rabbinic Network, were called just horrible names and I think treated rather poorly. Um, but the debate 
continued. And I think the document that we were able to gather lots of support for is a really good one um, in March. And it's not the original one. It's not mm -hmm. as strong as some people would have liked it. Uh, but and is there still a distinction then in terms of what well, it means to sanctify this uh, we, it's union? Left, it's left open, mm -hmm. which I think is its strength. Mm -hmm. uh, because the truth of the matter is, is that there are rabbis who will officiate and there are rabbis who won't. And because we're not a denomination or a movement that says, okay, everybody has to toe the same line on any issue, mm -hmm. it would be disingenuous for us to have said that in this resolution. So we spoke the truth. We support rabbis who do, and we support rabbis who don't. However, we also want to say that a relationship between two Jews of the same gender can be worthy of ritual sanctification. Now, we don't come up with a name for that, mm -hmm. but I think that is its brilliance. Mm -hmm. Because there even is a debate within our own gay and lesbian community. Mm -hmm. Is it, do we want to call it a wedding? Do we want to call it a commitment ceremony? Tell you, Sheila, I do a lot of, I call them wedding. I do a lot of weddings. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of ceremonies for our couples. Um, and oftentimes, people have been together for a long time, seven, eight, ten years. Um, and so it's really often a public affirmation of the commitments they've been making to one another for a long time. Right. So nomenclature, we'll leave that up to the individual and up to the rabbi to figure out how it fits best for them. For some, it will be a wedding. Well, it is an interesting thing for an excluded group. I mean, I remember when feminists first began to talk about marriage as an issue, because the examples of what marriage meant to women were often as negative as they were positive for the women. Right. And there was a lot of discussion about whether we needed to, in taking this look at it, whether we need to jettison this notion and do something else and call it something else. And no one ever really wanted to call it something else. It was one of those, once you can get into a thing, perhaps you should reform it from the inside. And this is the conversation we always have, right. you know, whether it's active asking whether anybody should run for the government or vice versa. And I think it's a very good and healthy dialogue to have about any institution. And of course, we talk about marriage as, as an, an institution. institution. Right. Do we want it or don't we want it? Do we want it the way it is? Do we want to be fully equal and therefore we need the word, but we'll do it a different way? Simply to open up the question by virtue of being excluded has been a very useful thing, I think. That, I think, is what's so great about this resolution is that by bringing together everyone, really, rabbis who will and rabbis who won't, because nobody there was about saying that gays and lesbians are less than mm -hmm. or are not entitled to have their civil rights. Mm -hmm. There's not, I don't think there, there wouldn't be a reform rabbi that really would say that. Mm -hmm. um, this was really about the religious and spiritual nature of that quality of what we call that. And I think the beauty of it is that this resolution also calls for uh, educational and pastoral materials to be prepared and published. And so that uh, a couple about a year from now, be able to call the Central Conference of American Rabbis and say, do you have a ketubah, a wedding document, mm -hmm. or a covenant document uh, for, two, for two gay men? And there's going to be one available mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. And the new Rabbi's Manual, which is the book that rabbis use, it has four funeral, different kinds of funeral set services and readings from different poems and psalms and has you know, baby naming ceremonies and wedding ceremonies has four wedding ceremonies and the one I have now, well, you're going to open it up and there's going to be gay and lesbian ceremonies mm -hmm. as well in the new one. Mm -hmm. That's been a commitment as part of this. So uh, that will be, as the institution develops, as more and more people avail themselves of the opportunity to publicly proclaim what their family is, whether, no, regardless of the legal status, but to publicly within the communities in which they worship and which they live, proclaim their familial status and do it religiously, do it spiritually, do it Jewishly. Um, that is going to change the, continue to change the nature of this dialogue, and I have a feeling it's not the last word, this resolution. No, probably not. Well, it's interesting the work you've done because there are a lot of people um, in leadership and communities of faith, in the clergy, who would, I think, although maybe not in the reform movement so much, uh, feel that 
being the you know the shepherd or the leader, the teacher, the counsel to their congregation is the spiritual work. Mm -hmm. That spiritual work is not involved necessarily yes. in a political national dialogue like this. Some people though do choose, and I, I assume see it as an aspect of their faith to to do this. What what is it that brought you to participate? I mean, a lot of people say, I couldn't not do it, but I'm not going to take that for an answer. What is it that brought you uh, to participate okay, yeah. in the political acts, uh, really, of this spiritual life? For me, it's a total spiritual journey. I don't, I don't separate it as just a political act. See, this is about my spirituality, because I believe in very strongly that each person has an obligation to make the world a better place. Now we have a Hebrew phrase for that, that's tikkun olam, the repair and healing of the world. But for me that is a religious article of faith, not just a political act. So I guess it's how you look at it. Um, and uh, I, for me this is a kind of living out of that faith is to be involved in it and to read, really read the scripture, read the prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah, uh, in that same way, that they were not afraid to stand up to the political powers of their day and take them to task when they stepped out of line or also was misusing the text. I mean, Isaiah asks, look, I don't want the fast of great piety. The fast I want is to feed the poor. And that's a political act not just a spiritual act, to challenge that. Say, oh, don't give me your, your holy, holier than thou business. <laughs> what are you really doing to help the people who need it? So for me, being involved, whether it's at the Central Conference of American Rabbis or in our own gay and lesbian movement issues, um, it's not just politics. It's about making the world a better place and helping people where they really live. And for me as a rabbi, the, the value, the Jewish value of family making is very, very important. And for us to have our gay and lesbian families seen as valid, loving, accepting families is very important. So it's not just politics that leads me to do that. When, I, when, I, when Benjamin, when our son, uh, asks questions, and he's a pretty savvy kid, he wants to know who stood under the chuppah, meaning who stood under the wedding canopy. That's his way of asking, hey, are they married, Ima? Are they married, Mom? <laughs> and he does that with he does that with gay couples, with straight couples. He wants to know that they've made a familial commitment mm -hmm. um, to one another. And I want him to be able to go to any reform synagogue in his denomination in the country and feel like his family could fit in as well. Uh, we've said that in the reform movement all along in our resolutions about civil rights. We've said it in terms of in 1990 saying, oh yes, we're going to ordain openly gay and lesbian people as rabbis. This issue around marriage was really kind of the f what I called the final link in terms of seeing someone's full spiritual life attainment. And that is that our life cycle events will be full, not just when we bury people. We've buried way too many of our friends mm -hmm. and our family members. We know what it is to stand at a grave and say the Kaddish prayer, the memorial prayer for the dead. But we also have to have the other parts of our life cycle celebrated and acknowledged as gay and lesbian people. And we learned that from being feminists. I think we learned as feminists we had to have ceremonies and rituals that celebrated our womanhood. Right. Um, and a challenge to the patriarchy. It isn't any different, I think, for gay and lesbian people to also claim their natural celebrations of our lives. And so my next goal, I think, Sheila, is to create religious coming out ceremonies so that we can celebrate our coming out and have our families participate in that too, our biological families, so that when a mom or a dad call me and say, Rabbi, my daughter's gay, and lesbian, my son's gay, I can wish them mazel tov and wish them congratulations. Um, that to me is the next challenge of our life cycle celebrations and our spiritual lives. Well, we'll have to do it also with our own congregants who are Absolutely. gay with their straight kids. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's part of our challenge. Is yeah, that, uh, I mean, it's, there are lots of possibilities, Absolutely. of course. Absolutely. Uh, so what is your greatest struggle now? Our greatest struggle? Well, I think that's just trying to balance everyday life with everybody else. Uh, our lives are so fast and 
furious. It's trying to make sure that their family time is is really there as well as take care of the needs of of our community. And I think that there our community still has great needs, great health needs. Mm -hmm. um, AIDS, I think, is not over by a far stretch. Um, and um, I think we have great pastoral needs, and I think we have to start talking about AIDS again in a way we've been kind of silent mm -hmm. for a long time. We have to talk about our children, both gay and straight. Um, and I think those are some of the great issues before us. And I think these next years in terms of our civil rights issues are really, really, really critical. And um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, um, that our loss on Proposition 22 uh, will really be turned around into a renewed sense of social activism um, for our community. Um, we can't be complacent, not one moment. We're not there yet. And we have some great issues, and I think that we're going to have to really step up to the plate and address them. I agree. I mean, I think that, it, in a way, I'm happy to have an ongoing struggle because it really gives meaning to my life. Yes. Um, which really brings me to my, uh, maybe my last question of the show, because it's not a short answer. Um, I, I'm, I, I've lived long enough to see sort of cycles in sort of majority values, and I don't just mean majority like straight people or the majority mm -hmm. of whatever race, etc., but sort of whimsically blowing through society of a set of values. and. Uh, the uh, revolutionary fervor of the late 60s and early 70s and the complacency or the me generation or whatever. We, we see these cycles. And it, it seems to me, and I could be wrong, I want to ask you that, th there is a yearning in more and more people to have a spiritual component of their lives. I don't know if there's more attendance at sort of traditional religious ceremonies I find that a number of people are going to smaller groups and sometimes creating their own spiritual communities um, in, you know, if they were raised Christian or Jewish or whatever. Uh, and I guess the, the question is kind of twofold. One is a little easier, which is, do you see this increase in, among people in their, in their yearning for a spiritual addition, component, peace, integration? of their lives. And I guess the other part of the question is, how does it enrich a person's life to have a spiritual or religious component? Well, I think the answer is, the short answer to your first question is yes, people are very thirsty, very thirsty for spiritual sustenance and nourishment. It plays into the second answer. And I think the reason why is because our lives move at such breakneck speed, there's no time to reflect or consider. We're pulled in so many directions. I mean, you know yourself, back and forth to Sacramento, all over our state, to learn about every issue and to know your constituents. You, you know, it takes a lot of energy to do that. And, and we thank God that you are doing it for us. But we also know that there has to be time, I think, for the human person to reflect and to make some sense of it all. And I think that's really, in the best sense, what religion does, what spirituality does. It gives us that opportunity to reflect and to put what we do in a larger context in relationship to other people, in to relationship to society, and as a religious person, I believe, in relationship to the force that you know, creates the universe and keeps it nourished and going. Um, and, I, and I really think that it also helps us clarify where we stand uh, in terms of our ethics and our values and our morals. And I think in our community, that's a dialogue we sometimes don't have often enough um, with one another, uh, let alone with anybody else. And I think that there is in our community a great thirst and hunger for that. You know, the other thing that's interesting to me is that in the, in the Jewish faith and in, I was, my mother a Jew, therefore I'm a Jew, but I was raised Catholic, my father a Catholic. And in both of these ceremonial lives, there is this rhythm of nature yes. that is also a part of it. Yes. Uh, where the life we, cycle. Yeah, but not just a life cycle, but say in the year. Yes. You know, the harvest, uh, the, mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the winter, the uh, rebirth. Yes. 
uh, and we share so many times of mm -hmm. holidays, you know, right. between and among all the different faiths. It, all based, I think, on the cycle of nature. Yes. And we've lost that. I mean, right. maybe it's just me because we're in a city here. <laughs> but with all that concrete and never your feet on the, you know, it's hard the to, earth. It's hard to know. Well, you know, when do the seasons change? You know, I mean, I think our ritual is <laughs> to spring forward or fall back, you know, <laughs> most people. But uh, I do think that's also part of what, you know, a spiritual life allows one to do is to literally stop and smell the roses and realize it's time to plant them as well as time to prune <laughs> them. Uh, and uh, I think that's, that's something that, that a spiritual life, a disciplined life can give to us, uh, which is so powerful. I mean, that's what, one of the reasons I'm so excited are, you know, our congregation's building a building from the ground up uh -huh. uh, here in West Hollywood, which is really exciting. And so um, I think that also allows us to appreciate uh, having the sense of being planted uh, in the earth, planted in the ground instead of the wandering Jews of West Hollywood, <laughs> uh, uh, makes a big difference. It does. Uh, and I know that you started out this uh, hour by talking about your, your love for music and your training. And I know that you integrate a great deal of music into all of the celebrations and worship in the congregation. Why is that an important aspect of worship? Well, I, because I think that, you know, worship is really like drama in the best sense, uh, because it, it's an expression using all of our senses um, of what we're feeling, what we're thinking, and how, how we can relate in the world. Now, not everybody's all in their head. Not everybody's a verbal person. Some people are visual. Uh, music allows us to get out of the other side of ourselves, just as art does, and dance. So I think all of those components, the, as I like to call it, the drama of worship, um, are really critical in having us able to express our innermost desires and as well as our needs um, and also helps us articulate perhaps in a less intellectual way. Sometimes we're all too much in our heads. Um, well, there aren't our always words needs. to the songs either. That's right. They're, I mean, they're, there are always an aspect that right. are just syllables. Uh, Nigo we call them nigoons, wordless, uh -huh. wordless melodies that also allow you to kind of transform the moment uh -huh. and um, kind of often move beyond the words to that f inner feeling state. Um, and we believe you can tap, that's the, one of the ways you can tap into the Shekhinah, God's divine presence on earth, God's feminine presence, one way you can tap into that energy is to do that without without words. And I know that you also um, honor members of the congregation uh, every year. It's it, it, the it, Shomer Tzedek Award. It's the guardian of justice it's, because we have this commitment to social justice and we believe it's an important religious component, spiritual component, and so we do honor people for their great civil civil rights work and justice work as we've honored you in the past. Well, it's, um, it's wonderful to talk to you, Denise. I, I think that uh, we haven't often really had on the show uh, a person who's, who's devoted their entire lives to sort of the spiritual in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the thread of your uh, intellectual pursuit, your, your calling to be a rabbi, and the sort of coming through and then coming out mm -hmm. about sexuality and making that work together, the local work in the congregation and the national work yes you know, with a conference and making that come together. And I think uh, it's interesting to me, though, that when I asked you your challenge, um, that what you said was really so much that is true for everybody these yes, days. How do I find the time to be all of these things that I now can be? Yes. You know, to be involved in this, I have to travel, right. I have my family, etc. But I was thinking, as you said it, I think you've done it very well. Thank you. Very well. <laughs> Um, and, I, uh, and I hope that uh, you will uh, call on us to be of any help as the, uh, as Kolomi constructs Thank its you. building. It's, and so we don't have to be wandering Jews anymore. No, that's in, right, that's uh, right. You know, in West Hollywood. Thank you. And I thank, thank you, you very much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me and uh, for all the work that you do for all of us. Uh, we appreciate what you do each and every day. Well, thank you. And thank you for being with us. Um, I hope you found this a spiritual uh, experience. And uh, you should have a whole lot of them so you can get used to it.